All right, so check this out. This is a little preview of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm opening up NeoVim here to a code base. I've got two files opened up. They're both calculator related. On the left-hand side, I'm going to trigger my FIM completions here. All right, so you can see I get a suggestion here. Now, watch what happens if I come over to the right-hand side here. Notice it says cannot divide by zero right here, and it says that right here as well. So those two parts basically mirror each other. So watch what happens if I come over here and change that message here. And let's just change this to cannot divide by your mom. All right, I will save that now, and I'm going to come back over to the file that I'm working on completing right now, and I'll go into insert mode to trigger another prediction here. Look at that, cannot divide by your mom. Come back over here. Let's come back over to this file. And let's just say by mom, by X mom. Go back into that case. It didn't predict that, but we can do it again here. Okay, cannot divide by zero. All right. This one seems to be a bit harder to match on. There you go. Cannot divide by X mom. Okay, so this is a really fun subject. I am super excited to show it. Let's get into the demo first and I'll break this down. But basically I've been working on a lot of changes to my code predictions tool. And well, I think it's best just to see this here. So I've got just a simple calculator class. It's great for demonstrating an example here. Watch what happens when I go into insert mode here. Of course, it's going to predict what I might want to complete with. And of course I can run that again and again, and I get different predictions each time here. One thing you'll notice though, as these predictions come in, one part that will probably be consistent most of the time is the implementation of the division function. If it adds it, sometimes it won't add it. Sometimes it'll only do something like add. Okay, in this case, you can see only did three instead of five. So anyways, this division function here, the error message specifically is the part that you will consistently see, basically say the exact same thing. And the reason for that Behind the scenes, when I do predictions, I'm not just passing the suffix and the prefix, or prefix and suffix. I'm passing that as well as I'm passing context. And some of that context is automatic. Specifically, I have an entire RAG pipeline set up that will look for code that might be pertinent and relevant. It'll find it, it'll score it, it'll give the top three results in, it'll stuff those in ahead of the fill in the middle prediction. So right before the prefix and suffix, it will have basically essentially context that gets added. And one of the pieces of context in this case right here, if I were to open up another file here. So in this particular file right here, you can see there is a division function and this should look very much familiar here. So I've come back over here, trigger this again. I can keep both of these opened up. You can see basically those division functions match. And the reason for that is behind the scenes, that pipeline is identified that this calculator code on the left is very much like what we have on the right here. And so it's providing the right document way ahead of the FIM. And so then when the model goes in and it makes a prediction, it's like, oh, well, you already have an example over here, basically the same thing. I'm going to use that as a starting point. Now, it's not exactly the same. You can see here, for example, there's a max, a max function here and there's a min function. Those are not the next two functions here. Maybe they're down further. Okay, those are further down here. But you can see it skipped over some of this, like the modulus, but it did take the division. It basically took that verbatim. And I can show you what that looks like here if... If I come over here on the right-hand side and I just come in and I edit this, so I'll change this and I'll have it say, cannot make you divide by zero. All right, the second I save that now, if I come back over to the prediction window here, remember this is a separate file. If I regenerate this, watch this. Look at that, cannot make you divide by zero. So it's actually updated. So behind the scenes, all of the embeddings for all of my code base, they're updated when you save files. And then those are available then to search when the next prediction comes in and you can see it actually uses it. So if I then come over here and change this again here, save that, all right, come back over here. And if I just re-trigger my prediction, look at that, cannot make you divide by your mom. Now, in order to make this happen, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. So first off, I have a language server to offload a lot of the work. I don't want this to bog down NeoVim here. That language server has access to an index that essentially covers the entire code base. In fact, let me actually show you that index here. So I'm gonna bail out of that prediction and I've got actually a little debug tool I set up to be able to see what exactly was matching as far as in that index when a request would come in. So I'm gonna open this up here. So I call this semantic grep because it basically is like searching your code base, except instead of searching maybe for text or a regular expression, in this case, you're going to just type something that you would like to find and it's gonna give you results then. So could imagine I could put in like an add function, for example. If I put that in here, we'll see what it comes up with. And I'm gonna zoom out a little bit here. This will be a bit small, but I wanna be able to see that preview over on the right-hand side here. Okay, so add function, what do we have here? Maybe this is gonna be the worst example I could possibly start with. 
We'll do a calculator class here and see what we come up. There you go. Okay, so in this case, you can see one of the very first matches here. This is a good match is for the ad. Actually, that's the, the code that I am filling in over on the right. That's the predictions I was triggering. That's that same file right there. So it actually found the exact file I was working on. And if I hit the arrow key down, look at this here. The second match it came up with. Well, it's that calculator class that we just modified. Can I make your mom divide by zero? And then if I keep going down, there are other calculator classes as well or related classes. So you can see here, I have various matches here to the query for a calculator class. And so any of these could then be provided as context. So these are basically the embeddings right here. You have the content as well as a vector that represents it. And the vector that represents it, just think of it as a model, basically, when you feed in a document in this case, which would be like the code right as it is right now, when you feed that in, it has a vector it can use to compress and describe that document. And maybe the best way to do it is if I took all the things in my office and I were to create an index of them, well, I could probably start listing characteristics of things like I probably have a lot of stuff that's technology. So anything that's a piece of hardware, I could maybe call it hardware and then technology, I could label that as well. And then there are other things like maybe I would have, maybe I'd have sticky pad here. So this is office supplies. So that could be another vector dimension. And then of course, there's other ways to look at the notepad because if I have a note sitting around here somewhere that has some technical notes on it, well, then that kind of has a little bit to do with technology. It also has something to do with the office supplies. So maybe it has a little bit of both there. So essentially you put in the document, the model spits out a vector that describes that document. That's a good way to compare it to other documents to see if they're related. And so it can look at the vectors essentially and to see, do they point in the same direction or do they have a lot of overlap in the same direction? And it can use that then to pick out the matches that it might want to go through. Okay, so once that happens and once those documents are selected, they're just chunks of the code base, by the way. I have a couple of ways that I index the code base. One is just by line ranges. So I'll just take a giant file and I'll split it up into chunks. Then I store those chunks. And then of course I store the vector as well for them so I can search that. And then another way I index the code base, I'm trying to move to this long-term is to actually use tree sitter. So right now I've got tree sitter set up to work good with Lua and Python code. At least it may work with some others that I haven't tested, but essentially I'm looking through that code then for nodes, like a function, for example, or a class in Python, instead of an arbitrary range of lines, I'm actually looking for something meaningful entirely. So if I just arrow down here, you can see right here, this one, if I zoom out a little bit more here, okay. Zoom out enough here, you can finally see my icons here for the types. This column right here, these are the types of the chunks. So this one's got a little tree icon. So that means that's from tree sitter. And then I've got the other one looks like a document, a little white page of paper. That would be one of the line range ones. You can see in the case of tree sitter here, these actually, okay, and that's interesting. That's an anonymous function that does nothing. Totally interesting that it matched that. But this one you can see obviously a few lines of code instead of just a range of lines. This actually has to do with one specific function. And I think I'll be getting better results I know I did actually start getting better results once I had the ability to target functions instead of ranges of lines. So anyways, my goal here long-term is to get TreeSitter to cover an entire Python code base, but right now I'm only targeting functions and classes. Those are the easiest to get started with. And then I basically have my fallback of line ranges after that. And so you even see some overlap between these here because I haven't, the line ranges runs over the whole code base. I don't take anything out based on TreeSitter. Eventually I'll probably take out the lines that are covered by TreeSitter so I don't cover them within line ranges as well. But right now, I, I didn't want to make that too complex. So essentially, I index the code base by chunking it. Those chunks then are turned into vectors. Those vectors can be compared then to a query vector. A query vector, for example, would be a fill in the middle request here. So where my cursor is at, the prefix and suffix, that forms a vector that can describe a document that might be related to other ones, finds related ones, pulls those back then. So that's the embeddings stage, essentially, where it's just looking for the vectors that are similar. It gets back a list of those similar vectors. And I think right now I take up to 50 of them. Initially, I was only taking a handful, like 10 of them, but it works so darn fast here to search. Like, watch this. If I just drop off the S, maybe that took a second. And it's not just the comparison of the vectors because the next stage happens. So after those embeddings are matched, the documents that are possible matches come up. I then pass it through a second stage. And that second stage is feeding it into an LLM, basically, and asking the LLM to score, give a probability for whether or not that particular document relates to the query at hand. So it's gonna look through all these documents here and I'll find things that are just not relevant. In fact, you can see over on the left-hand side is a score here. These are low scores, but obviously the first few matches here are calculator related, so they're a pretty high score here. Then pretty quickly you drop off here down to 6%. By the time you're down here, these are documents that are probably not really related, though I guess in this case, we are dealing with calculator stuff still, but if I come down far enough, maybe I'll find some totally unrelated code. 
Okay, here, well, that's still adding. Sorry. Maybe I won't even find anything. Oh, yeah, here's something that's completely unrelated. This ask OpenAI function here has nothing to do with calculators. It still was a match, but it got pushed down then by the re ranking down to 0.1%. So once I re rank, then I know my topmost matches are the ones that I want to look at. And so that is then used as a sorting criteria to display it here. So both of those stages of the process happen. Every time I type a keystroke, all of that happens. And within, well, you can see here, I also have to do the FEM prediction after that. So once I get those documents, then those go into a prompt to do the FEM prediction. So that's a third stage basically to all of this. So every time I type a key here, look how fast that happens. You can barely even notice the delay there. We're talking maybe half a second at most there, probably more like two, 300 milliseconds before you start to get a result there from the FEM prediction. So all of those stages have to happen, embedding, re-rank, and then FEM prediction. And so it's just been incredibly fast. I think it's really neat to see, especially as you edit documents here and you can see those vectors get updated as you edit them. Like I said, I was modifying this right here. If I come over here and change this again here, we'll just go back to where we were. Let's do 10 here and see if it can come up with the same thing. Right now, while I was talking, right when I hit save, it's done by now. The vector has been updated. And so now it's available then for that search. If I come back over here and I just go back into insert mode and trigger a new completion, look at that. You can see cannot divide by 10. So all in all, really cool set of technology. It took a long time to put together the pieces. And now they're together, though, it's really neat to see the final effect. And that's that I wanted to be able to pull context from my whole repo without always having to target it manually. Now, there's nothing wrong with targeting manually. I love targeting context manually, where I go in and I select something I think is relevant, I copy to the clipboard, that becomes available for FIM as well. Or I have other features where I can use C tags for things that might be relevant. Of course, that's a little bit automatic, so I guess that's not manual. Um, I also had, at one point, I had it set up to go off of recent edits or maybe Git commits. Again, somewhat automatic in some cases, other cases not. So I've been adding a bunch of different types of context for FIM predictions, also for other types of AI requests that I make here. It's not just FIM predictions, but I also wanted to be able to do things like rewrite some of this code here. So if I just select all of this, so instead of asking for a FIM prediction, I could ask it to, I could ask it to finish this class. Down in the prompt, it's hard to see because I've zoomed in so much, but I'm typing in my prompt to the LLM. In this case, I'm asking it to rewrite some code here. Instead of predicting some code, I'm asking it to just rewrite a chunk of code for me here. And I guess that model's offline right now. Let me bring that one online real quick. That one I am using GPT OSS for. It's been super awesome for this purpose. We'll bring it online. I've got that one down, down here, running down here. I've got the other Llama one running up here. I'm using Llama server for all this. It's incredibly fast here. So I'll undo that and then select all this again. We'll try that one more time here. So I'm also providing rag context for this as well. You can see right there. Now, in this case, it, it went with cannot divide by zero. So it must not have got the exact same match here. Let's let's uh, run that again here and see if we come up with something different. Oh, well, okay. It's not actually going off of the context I'm providing here. That's interesting. I'm going to go troubleshoot here real quick because I'm curious to see if ah, I've got to turn on a debug mode to figure this out. So I'm going to split this here. I'm going to turn on a debug mode. It'll get a bit noisier on my screen here. That's all right, though. And repeat that request here. I'm just curious to know if it actually was matching anything. Okay, we have some rag matches. Did I not provide them or were they just not relevant here? You can see here is that rag document match though for that same file, that 14B calculator class here. So it is providing that cannot divide by 10, but GPT OSS is just too smart for it. I guess I need a dumber model <laughs> to get it to go along with that. Maybe if I can say, I can actually probably prompt it to do this here. So let's do like my, let's ask it to do it like my other calculators. Okay, look at that. It actually used cannot divide by 10 in that case. Now, it's a flip of the coin whether or not something matches. Sometimes it might match. Other times it may not match. It's not like it's a predictable thing where you're always going to get the exact same set of matches or embeddings. But as you're working on your code and you're changing it, you're kind of pushing it in that direction of having more context about what you're working on. And that's the context that's in use to select the documents that hopefully then become the context to then fulfill whatever request, like a fill in the middle or a rewrite request. So it's kind of a multi-stage process where as you work on your code, the idea would be you're more likely then to match the parts of your code, the rest of your code base that you need to then get those matches automatically to 
do the next thing that you're going to work on in your code base where you're maybe asking AI to make a little change to something. And yeah, I think I'm just going to stop there for right now. I will have more videos. I do want to talk about the embeddings a bit more. So keep an eye out for that. And yeah, if this is something you haven't tried out, if you find any tools that use this that make RAG context available within your chats or within your rewriting, or if you have predictions that can do it, definitely try it out. See how you feel about it. Index some code and just see what happens. I think you're going to be surprised that you oftentimes will get really good suggestions based on something that automatically matched. And part of the reason I say that, and again, I'm have another video about this is I've been really impressed with the results that come up here when I just do searches. This was intended as a debug tool and I turned it into an actual search tool because I use it now. I can go to a new code base and I can actually search and find things about that code base that might otherwise take me a couple of hours or maybe 30 minutes to find if I don't know my way around. I'm finding that I can use this then to find different parts of the code base to then go read those and learn more about that code base. So I'll have another video about that soon.